All right, so hello everyone. Welcome to uh, our latest snack seminar. It is a great pleasure uh, today for me to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Anna Levina. Uh, Anna is an assistant professor at the University of Tübingen in Germany. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to introduce her because uh, I've known Anna for a long time, uh, over a decade now. It's funny how we're just talking about how old our kids are. It's crazy how, how time flies. Uh, I initially met Anna through her husband, uh, Georg Martius. Uh, who I knew through the artificial life community uh, initially. And, and later on, I came to realise that uh, my research interests are much closer to, uh, to Anna's work uh, than Gail's, which was, which was quite, quite interesting. Uh, we then turned out to be sharing an office at the Mark Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Sciences, uh, which, was, uh, which was really nice. Although I don't think either of us were there that much because again, coming back to our kids, they were very small and we worked from home a lot. This was before COVID, before working from home was cool. Uh, anyway, uh, these days Anna leads a group on self-organisation and optimality in neural networks. Uh, she, she's funded by the Sofia uh, Kovaleskaya Award of the Humboldt Foundation. How's that pronunciation? Is that, a, is that okay? Good. Uh, and before that, as I say, uh, a long time ago now, she was a, a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Sciences in Leipzig, and after that, an independent research fellow at IST Austria. Going back further in time again, uh, she obtained a, a PhD in maths from Göttingen University and before that finished her studies in mathematics at St. Petersburg uh, State University. Uh, so she has a, a wonderfully mixed background between maths and physics and neuroscience, which is just the kind of person that we love to have talking in snacks. So over to you, Anna. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your invitation and for this very nice introduction. Uh, so today I will try to uh, compress two of the topics that I'm very passionate about. One is modeling and modeling systems uh, close to the critical point and understanding the computation in those systems. And the other one is uh, uh, understanding the data from the uh, recordings uh, of neural systems. This is a new uh, uh, part that I am starting to becoming more and more neuroscientist and maybe less and less mathematician. Uh, so let's uh, go in and see what is the uh, uh, object of study. So this is our ideal beautiful object. It is brain, possibly human brain, and it is composed of enormous amount uh, of uh, parts, even if we are as physicists would consider them all the same, it's still 10 to 11 neurons with the amount of axons that is sufficient to wrap the earth four times. Uh, if we are thinking about how to decompose it to understand the computations, then we typically would decompose it into the network structure and understanding of how the activity evolves on the structure. Here I show you a very simplified type of system. This is a, a recordings from dissociated culture that, that present this beautiful population bears that we see here uh, filmed in calcium. Putting this together still feels like a very complicated, enormously high dimensional system. So one of the ideas how to get an insight in it uh, would be that we want to describe dynamics uh, of this uh, beautiful system by something that is much more low dimensional, possibly even single dimensional, and we would try to call it a state. And then after we did the description, we can try asking, are all the states same suitable to do computations, are there some particularly good ones, and maybe there is a diversity of states for different situations. However, right now I still did not define the state. And for some of the uh, possibilities, we can label states by observing an animal. If this is an animal brain, for example, here, there is a state that we can very easily discriminate one between sleep and wakefulness. And within sleep, we even can discriminate different sleep stages. So these states we can label from behavior, from observing uh, the animal. There are other states that we can understand typically by observing the statistics, either of behavior of a, a neural act, uh, activity, for example, the attentional states. Uh, and in each particular time, it's a bit hard to uh, pin down. And some we can now uh, only understand in activity, but we don't know exactly how to map it back to the behavior. For example, in this uh, dissociated cultures, we have population versus synchronization would be possibly a specific state. Uh, 
Uh, however, the sad part is that there is no very strict definition that would unite everything. Uh, and maybe my attempt to say that this some kind of a meaningful low dimensional description is the best we could do so far. Uh, however, we can uh, jump a little bit around uh, and uh, use a physics insight in understanding what could be one of dimensions of defining a state by looking at how close is a system to the transition, for example, between a very mixed or chaotic state, uh, like here, where the neighborhood of every pixel is everything and the spatial correlations decay immediately to zero, or this particularly ordered state that feels also to be something relatively boring. Uh, and the state we would be interested in is on the border between this mixed chaotic state and perfectly ordered state that would be, for example, this beautiful picture of Jason Pollock uh, that I mixed up to get the other two states. And the signature of the state uh, statistically would be a, a, a heavy tail distribution of spatial correlations in this case. Uh, this is if we just care about space and mixing. On the other side, we can also uh, consider a temporal propagation of signals. Uh, and sometimes the signals we en uh, enter into the system would not spread at all. So we put it, it's forgotten. It has, for the physics, an absorbing state at no propagation. And on the other side, we can have something that would be spreading exponentially. Uh, and on the border, uh, we have a critical transition between activity that dies out and activity that is spreading exponentially. And we can mathematically show that there is a point uh, in between if we use, for example, the description by branching processes. Uh, and in this point, we would have a, a power law distribution uh, of the activity or information propagation paths. Uh, some would propagate through a very large part of the system and some would just uh, die uh, in the very uh, die out in the very beginning and not propagate at all, hopefully not our papers. Uh, and this critical point has a lot of uh, interesting features for computation uh, in the various uh, models where honestly say different types of definition of which border we consider uh, various information um, properties uh, were shown to be optimized around this critical transition. Uh, for example, uh, information storage and transfer or the dynamic range, which I would be talking a lot uh, about later were all shown to be uh, maximized close to this critical transition. So it feels like if we would be able to map the brain state onto the single dimensional uh, uh, description, uh, being close to the critical state would be a great idea to optimize the computations. And indeed, uh, by uh, looking at the particular features of the recordings in different modalities, uh, various researchers found indications that this might be a case from uh, both uh, very detailed spike recordings up to coarse grain, the whole system uh, recordings like fMRI or EEG. So if we want to be optimal for something, what is it that we want to be optimal for? Uh, in the real world, we want to be optimal for the everyday task. We want to be able to perform them quite good. Uh, and if we want to classify the everyday tasks might come in two uh, most common flavors. One are the tasks that we do every day or very repetitively and frequent, uh, say crossing the road. And the other tasks that we do real, quite uh, uh, seldom like selecting the high school. And for this type of task, we actually logically thinking would be having different strategies. For this repetitive and frequent tasks, we can pre-train and maybe overtrain to do them well. However, this unique and seldom task we need to be able to solve individually. Uh, and from the other side, looking at 
what the stars bring uh, with them as a requirement, uh, the, uh, this fast decision-making task, like do I cross the road or do I stay, uh, uh, would uh, need a very uh, fast decision. So they have to be pre-trained because otherwise we might be too slow deciding and we'll get on the car. And this uh, seldom and unique task quite often have the long time to decide. So we actually can afford solving them individually. Uh, and what I believe uh, is an important question is, do we need the same system to solve or the same state to solve these different types of tasks? Uh, and maybe the brain state that would be corresponding to solving them would be actually various. Uh, that's what we would explore in this talk. Uh, so here uh, are uh, the main topics I would be touching upon. Uh, the first one would be uh, looking at the particular example of what could be optimized by the system, namely dynamic range. Uh, and with it, we start now. So what is an addition for the dynamic range? Let's imagine that we are in the auditory realm and we plot uh, on the x-axis the sound intensity. Uh, and on the y-axis, we plot either our perceptual uh, variable or maybe a neural response that leads to this perceptual variable. So classical response curve would suggest that for very quiet sounds, we would have a low response. And this response would not be different much when we vary the sound intensity, as long as this is very low. So if somebody is whispering, uh, on the other side of the room, uh, either it is going a little bit higher, a little bit lower in intensity, we would not be able to discriminate. On the other side, if the ambulance just drives into the office, uh, it is very loud and, mo uh, and it would uh, elicit a saturating response uh, where we also most probably wouldn't be able to discriminate as small variations in the sound intensity. However, in between these two extremes, there is a big range where from understa uh, understanding the response, we would be able to reconstruct the relative sound intensity. And in sound realm, this is very important for us because this would be predictive to whether the source of the sound approaching us or moving away from us. And indeed, such response curves are typically observed in a sensory system and uh, uh, in many other uh, areas throughout the brain. And now we can strictly define what would be the dynamic range. Uh, as it was uh, proposed, uh, being inspired by the uh, physical and engineering um, applications, we could take the response curve and somewhat arbitrarily cut the 10% uh, of the lowest responses and uh, or 10% of the highest responses. Here, it's uh, uh, this 10% are really arbitrary border. Uh, and we just defined that everything above 90% of responses saturation, everything below 10% is uh, also saturation to no response. And then we can look at the input intensities on logarithmic scale that lead to these responses within the border between 10 and 90%. And the interval of these responses would be called a dynamic range. What was uh, shown that in the recurrent networks that I would a bit more uh, introduce in the next slide, uh, if we drive system close to the critical point, the dynamic range would be maximized. And if we go away from criticality, there would be a decline in dynamic range. This was shown in the model of recurrent network, uh, and it was also applied to the uh, actual network in a cortical slices where we can probe something very similar by pharmacologically modulating this network and measuring responses to the activation of individual electrodes here, when the electro uh, where there were recordings with 60 electrode, uh, multi electrode array. And the similar situation is observed, then unperturbed uh, uh, slices that were shown to be close to critical have an average higher dynamic range than the ones that uh, underwent uh, pharmacological manipulation. Uh, 
And we were interested in the model parts for now. And let's start with a very simple model. For example, we have the N uh, a random binary neuron. So they could be either on and off. Uh, and if one of them is on, it has a certain probability to activate its neighbors. Uh, it could be on a fully connected network, it could be on a random network, but now it doesn't uh, matter. But what is important is that the sum of all outgoing probability of a single node is, or the average sum of outgoing probability of a single node is our control parameter. We would call it M and it is uh, a branching ratio or it is an approximation of the branching ratio uh, if we were living in a, a mathematical world. And depending on this uh, control parameter, we can have three important scenarios. If, the, uh, if M is smaller than one, which means that for one, near, uh, for one active uh, node, on average, there would be less than one active node uh, in the next time step then activity would be definitely dying out with probability one. Uh, if M is larger than one, so for each single active node, there would be on average more than one active node next time point, activity would start funneling out and it would uh, have a non-zero probability to run forever and overtake the whole network. And then there is a sweet spot in between at exactly m equal one, where activity would die out with probability one. However, the distribution of uh, activity uh, propagation sizes measured either in time or in how many nodes were participating in activity propagation would have a power law um, shape and would be the transition point between this dying out and taking over the whole network. Uh, this is an old model that was uh, studied already almost 15 years ago. Oh, 15. Uh, what uh, we looked particularly at additionally uh, is the situation where we have uh, here started by this um, mm, lighting bolt uh, by external activation and uh, activity propagation. And then it goes until there is nothing, and then the next activity propagation may be started. So we would be interested at first in the distribution of the sizes of activity propagations. Uh, however, sometimes something happens, like here, where there are two different neurons who could have activated one. Who of them did it? How do we account for the fact that if this one already activated the, uh, uh, that neuron, then we kind of discount the activation uh, by the other one. Uh, oh, I should have had this guy. So uh, here, uh, and the same situation happening here. Uh, this this neuron, for example, might have activated this one, but it can have could have been also activated by the other one. And this way, we would kind of. Uh, discard this probability of activation from our uh, considerations. This is what we call a coalescence. And in this network, we can measure the sizes of this uh, propagation uh, sequences. And here is a cutoff that is given by the size of our network. And we have something in the log log scale that looks like a very nice power law distribution. Uh, Paolo distribution log log scale looks like a straight line. This is amazing straight line with a characteristic exponent around 1.5. So now what we could do, we could say, hmm, but there are these points where they call us. Maybe we can kind of compensate for the fact that at the point when this neuron is already activated by one, it is not possible to add additional activation of this neuron by the other one. So at the point when there are many neurons active simultaneously, we could raise the probability of activation to compensate for the fact that they might call us as the same neurons. And indeed, we can compute analytically how to change the probabilities of activation. Uh, and it is a little bit ugly formulas, but the thing is that we can also solve it much easier by introducing a, a, a linear probabilistic integrating fine neurons that would just first sum up the inputs and then decide whether to fire or not in probabilistic manner. And if we do any of, of this, 
equivalent approaches, what's happening is that this coalescence compensated network shows a scale free behavior for uh, much larger um, uh, event sizes, so up to the n square. And this looked very impressive. So our main question afterwards was, OK, we made our network kind of much more critical, or it looks like it is much more critical. Uh, will we see it if we look at the dynamic range? So here is a dynamic range of the original network without compensating for coalescence. And now we compensate for coalescence. And this looks a little bit disappointing. It is still optimized close to the critical point. And if we compensate for coalescence, we cannot survive going above critical point. It explodes for sure. Uh, but it's not really larger. Uh, so after a while of contemplating our disappointment, we looked a bit more precisely at which stimuli these networks could discriminate. So this previous network where the uh, connection strength was fixed uh, could discriminate this. Now I highlight them as a discriminable interval. So this is an interval of the input that the uh, network could discriminate uh, from the output. And here I change the parameter of the uh, connectivity uh, from critical to subcritical and supercritical. And what we see that although the critical one, the red one, is the longest, they are basically all at the same spot. So we do win a little bit by tuning the network to criticality, but we get always the same stimuli, more or less uh, discriminated. And now let's switch to this coalescence corrected network. And what's happening is that although they have much more homogeneous uh, and slightly smaller uh, discriminable intervals, the discriminable intervals are covering altogether a very large amount of the input space. So the natural idea that in a bit different context was already uh, discussed by Leonardo Colo uh, is to combine them together. And this way, for example, if we have a particular input distribution, say it has a bimodal distribution with a very different magnitudes of possible stimuli, we could just say, OK, we want two subnetworks one that is very close to critical and one that is uh, quite subcritical. And combining them together, we can generate a response distribution that would have a, a well discriminable intervals exactly where our distribution of stimuli lives. Uh, and this way, we can optimize the system for uh, distribution of stimuli independently uh, on where, what was the domain of this uh, stimuli? And this would have been impossible with this uh, networks that were considered before. It would require the renormalization of stimuli. Uh, so this was uh, an insight for us to see, OK, maybe we can, even with the dynamic range, improve something. And having different networks uh, can help us. And then we teamed up again with Johannes, who was a leading author on the um, uh, previous story, uh, and uh, my student Sahel, uh, with some help of our friend Viola. And we considered a little bit different setup, where we uh, explicitly look at uh, neurons that are uh, uh, reading out uh, reading in information, reading out information. So we would have the same recurrent network, but it would have input and output separate, which is a little bit more re relevant than to read out from whole population and input uh, signal to everybody in the network. Uh, the response curve would look very similar. Uh, but here, what we very rapidly realized is what is this response curve? This response curve is an infinite average of what is the response if we input this particular signal. And to get this very beautifully determined line, we really need to wait forever uh, until it converges to give us a single mean. However, in any realistic scenario, we have some finite time to make a decision about the stimulus. 
So what would change if instead of inputting the whole the sequence, we would, for example, input the chunks of one second? And clear enough, what's happening is that we're generating a variance around this uh, infinite time mean response uh, that is defined by the time that we uh, give the network. So let's look at one example. Here we have two different stimuli that are inserted in the same network. The stimuli have slightly different um, intensity and we could chunk it here in one second chunks. So this is a long-term average, they are different. And here would be these chunks uh, that also look quite different from each other. So for basically each pair of the chunk, we would be able to say, okay, this is the input that was more strong and this is the same input that was weaker. Uh, here is how it would look like in this response curve. This are the two inputs that generated these two responses. And here there are the distributions of the means over a one second time interval. Uh, however, we did it now for one network that was quite subcritical. Let's now move close to the more critical network. And that's what we would observe. There is close to criticality, a large variability of responses. Uh, this is one of the positive side that we actually wanted to explore with the dynamic range. However, if we bound the amount of time we could uh, use to make a decision, here we see there is quite often uh, even a wrong order between the two stimuli, so we would not be able to say which one was more uh, intense uh, looking at this one second observation. This can be captured well by considering the distribution of responses to, it, to the pairs of stimuli at a particular uh, distance in the stimulus space. The overlap between these responses distribution would be a probability of making a mistake which stimulus is which when we present it with both uh, in a certain order. And now our idea was how do we incorporate this short time? We're looking at uh, when is the discrimination error not very large. So we could say, for example, we allow for an error of 10%. And then what we can do, we look at how we should space the inputs that the overlap between neighboring inputs would be 10%. This would be the maximal amount of inputs we can jam into the whole space of inputs such that the network would be able to not mix up the neighboring ones. And now we can use this as a definition of dynamic range incorporating the fact that there could have been a finite observation time or maybe any other source of additional noise that we would have in the network. Now our main source of the noise is just the fact that the uh, uh, natural fluctuations of the signal, we could have also uh, uh, add noise in a different way. And then we can mimic the original distribution uh, definition of dynamic range by looking at the range between the smallest and the largest of the discriminable input, uh, interval, uh, inputs, or we could look at how many were there or at how dense they are. Uh, all these three measures could be considered together or separately uh, for the networks. And now uh, the cool thing is that if we take the infinite, if we give the system infinite amount of time, we can compute all these measures uh, analytically. Here uh, I'm showing for the resolution because this is uh, the clearest picture. Uh, however, they all look very similar. So in the limit uh, and to infinity, uh, this would uh, rise and then stay uh, basically at the same almost indistinguishable level. Uh, and if we uh, take only a single step, uh, in the discrete step, uh, in the discrete time model, we also can compute analytically. And here we would have a, a clear peak uh, for the uh, control parameter. Okay, now it is uh, lambda, it should have been m. Uh, and now we can change how much time we have. So this is analytics, this is the numerics, 
from the simulation for one millisecond. Uh, this is very similar. We have a one millisecond time step, so they should uh, more or less coincide. And then as we shift to larger and larger observation times, the system shifts towards the infinite time limit and the maximum also shifts towards the larger and larger values where the critical point would be at one. The same happens if instead of this resolution that is a little bit uh, maybe constructed measure, we would look at the mutual information between input and output. Uh, in the infinite time um, system, the maximum of the uh, mutual information would be uh, at the critical point. However, as soon as we go for the short observation windows, the uh, optimal uh, control parameter would be shifting towards the subcritical regime. And basically what we would see is that the longer observation window, the closer the optimal state to criticality. Thinking about the uh, tasks uh, we uh, I mentioned before, it looks like the stuff that would allow us to think about what's happening would profit the most from the system being close to critical and the ones that need to be decided on a very short pace should possibly be better served by somewhat subcritical system. It's not very subcritical. Uh, uh, talking to uh, say Viola, we would say, okay, this is actually very close to the critical point. Uh, but it is better than to be slightly subcritical. And this is also uh, um, kind of mimicking or um, was uh, observed similarly in neuromorphic computing uh, by Kramer et al. together with Viola Prisman. So to summarize this part, uh, oh yeah, uh, we seen that the propagation of activity would be strongly influenced by coalescence or by local topological structure of the network, and that uh, com uh, compensating the coalescence would generate us a nice scale-free distribution, much more scale-free than the one that we uh, have in non-coalescence corrected network, that we could use the ensemble of coalescence corrected networks to uh, map out arbitrary distribution of stimuli uh, on the other side, if we additionally to this uh, bring in the fact that there is a finite observation window to make a decision, this would generate noise in the output of the network. And the definition of dynamic range has to be adapted to incorporate its noise and one possibility is to include this minimal discrimination error bound. And this would uh, end up into the, in the result that the longer the observation window, the closer to the critical point is the system that would turn out to be optimal. Okay, and then now I would very happily and fast rush through uh, whether something like this is actually can be observed in the brain. So uh, now uh, we uh, need to set up how do we measure how far from critical point we are. And one of the options is to look at the intrinsic time scale of activity. What we know is that uh, at critical point, the time scale is infinite. So the longer the time scale uh, in intrinsic activity, the closer we are to the critical point. Uh, and there were beautiful results, uh, uh, for example, from John Murray showing that if we look at the intrinsic time scale of the whole brain areas uh, measured by average in neurons from this brain area, we would see an uh, um, ordering of these time scales such that the more sensory uh, areas would have a short time scales and the areas that are more related to information processing and uh, would have a longer time scale. And such a hierarchy of time scales would also observe uh, in uh, different recording modalities, both in ECOG and uh, fMRI, functional magnetic. So now we would, uh, together with my student Raksana uh, and Tatiana Engel from Cold Spirit Harvard Laboratory and her postdoc Yang Lang, look at what's happening if instead of taking the whole brain area, we take only very local activity and we consider it during a task. 
So here we use the data uh, from Tillian's Moore lab recorded by Nikolai Steinmetz and from Alexander Tillian lab recorded by Mark Gizerman. It is recorded from the multi electron array that is inserted perpendicular to the cortex. What is important for us in it that we have 16 channels and these channels record very similar location in the receptive fields. So it's neurons that react to approximately the same stimulus. And what we do, we for now just combine all of them uh, to get more data. If you're interested why this is fine, we can discuss it afterwards. Uh, and in the uh, task, we know here is the receptive field that was measured by the uh, by the experimentators and the, uh, its spontaneous activity, monkey just had to fixate the fixation point. And now what we're doing, we're looking at that autocorrelation function. So functions that maps uh, time lag to how uh, correlated are, uh, uh, is this uh, cortical activity at this time lag. And, if, and we plot it in logarithmic linear scale. So if we see straight line there, this means that there is an exponential decay at autocorrelation and the slope of this decay denotes a time scale. So this is for this fixation task. And the most interesting task is a task where there is an attention. Uh, here, the monkey needs to discriminate whether there was a change in one of the Gabor-like stimulus that was presented uh, uh, during the presentation time. And the monkey in the beginning is informed to um, fixate at the fixation task and then given a cue that would tell uh, at which direction most probably the change might happen. So change might happen in any of the four stimuli, but it's given a cue where it's most probably uh, changing this way, steering the attention of the monkey. And there is a special um, um, part of the experiment that tells also that the other one uh, is also uh, very special for the monkey. So both these two conditions would be an attention condition where monkey is instructed to attend uh, where the receptive field is. And the other two we can take as a control condition where uh, the attention should be uh, uh, paid to the directions that we are not recording from the other parts of the cortex. And that's what we would see if we, uh, if we record, the, uh, if we represent the data by this autocorrelation. Uh, for the uh, attention way, we have very similar shape as in the spontaneous activity. Uh, and it is, it looks like there is an increase, a particular increase in a slow uh, timescale part for uh, the case where monkey attends towards the stimulus. And here we formulate two hypotheses. One that there are two time scales, the one that corresponds to this very fast beginning part, and the other one that corresponds to this long exponential decay. And importantly, that the slow time scale would be decre would be increased by attention. Uh, what we uh, found out is that actually making the statement very solid in statistical sense is not. Uh, a uh, simple uh, task uh, because there is a statistical bias in estimation of time scales here. I will very briefly jump over this. Uh, if you're interested in how to measure time scales, uh, Roxana made a beautiful uh, package and uh, this ABC tau package, and we published a paper that explains why and how uh, you should be doing the measuring of time scales correctly. But if we return to the data, we can make a very strong model selection uh, arguments using the base factor uh, that defines which model is better with one time scale or with two time scale. So we first decide whether the two time scale model is at all reasonable. Uh, and this uh, can be done using the distribution of errors. And indeed, if we use it, and compute the base factor. Now you would have to believe me and ask if you want more details uh, that the two time scale model defines, uh, describes data much better. And this is the uh, same way for most of the recordings. And then if we go to the uh, attention versus uh, non-attended condition, we can also strictly check uh, that 
uh, the first hand scale for the beginning, the smaller legs, uh, is not changing. So the posterior distributions are completely overlapping, whereas the uh, uh, second time scale is increased very significantly uh, by attention. And this uh, happening, if we measure it individually on all uh, different sessions, uh, it happens significantly for three different monkeys. And this increase is also visible in the uh, behavioral uh, signatures that we could observe from the monkeys, namely, we can look at the reaction time and there uh, see at which uh, at which trials with which time scale uh, the reaction time would be short or longer. And what we see is that in the attention towards the uh, goal condition, the reaction time is to some extent predicted by the time scale. And if a monkey is not attending, uh, then it is not related. And if we go to the model, we can use a very similar model to the one I showed before, but on the, uh, on the grid. So we have local interactions. This is important in Cortex. We have a lot of local interactions. We cannot just take a random network. And here we would have, again, this control parameter. Uh, now we also allow uh, units to self-activate. It would define this self time scale and propagate to the neighbors. And we can match very closely this model to the data. And we can show that change from the, if, if we take all the multitude of models in this parameterization that could match the data, then the models that uh, uh, match the attention away condition are basically slightly more subcritical than the models that are matching the attention condition. That's what we would also expect from the fact that the time scales got longer. So what we can hypothesize that the regime is moving close, the, the, the state of the network is moving closer to the critical uh, when, um, uh, when, when, when uh, neurons, oh, when a monkey attempts to toward the stimulus. And uh, this being close but not at critical point was uh, seen in a multiple different like in, in, in the temporal or spatial domain, it was shown in the different data sets. It might be exactly where the uh, cortex is functioning. So to summarize this part, and this would be basically the end, uh, we can uh, fit the time scales nicely. And it looks like there are multiple time scales in the activity of uh, uh, local populations of neurons in visual cortex of uh, uh, primates, particularly V4. Uh, and that the slow time scale, but not the fast one, uh, is uh, extended when animal is attending towards the, stim to towards the receptive field of the recorded uh, neurons. Uh, and that kind of the strong recurrent networks maybe uh, can, uh, uh, allow for very uh, fast uh, tuning from um, subcritical to more critical that would uh, nicely capture the changes in the autocorrelations that we observed in the data between uh, attention away and uh, attended uh, condition. So the data, the data analysis part uh, or the method part is published and the other one you can look up at the archive if you want. Uh, and for the adaptation in long run, I already thought that this would not happen. Uh, and so I just put a teaser in case you want to learn more, invite me again. Uh, so there is, uh, we, we uh, uh, reviewed what was done before with the synaptic adaptation towards a particular critical state and we looked at the data from dissociated cultures, uh, like the ones I showed in the very, very beginning, uh, and showed that it seems that the neurons of a long time periods adjust to the amount of inhibitions they are uh, given uh, to always stay in the stable activity state. So what we've seen is that uh, it might be the different distances to criticality are preferred 
For example, if we have a different amount of noise that may be generated by the different amount of time we can, uh, we have until we have to make a decision. And that combining different distance to criticality networks might also bring us additional benefits in increasing the range uh, of the input that we can securely cover. And the last part was to see that actually in the uh, local brain networks, we see this different time scales, possibly different distances to criticality, and the dynamic change that seems to be very fast because it changes between the trials where it is attending and the next trial where it is not attending. So with this, I would like to thank my lab, my uh, wonderful collaborators, and my funding uh, sources, and please ask some questions. <laughs>